So one memory stands out the most from those six weeks, which was when I tried to engage and be a bit more inclusive in a dinner conversation at a large family formal gathering. So the family had a big welcome for me. They invited like extended family members, neighbors, and I was introduced as the American and how exotic. And um, at some point during the evening, I was asked by the grandmother of the family how I found the French food. And I wanted to impress her and my host family, but I didn't really have the right words yet. My vocabulary was still weak, but I didn't want her to think that I was some uncouth American who only ate junk food and you know all the stuff that they probably see in the movies. Um, and that I appreciated that their delicate, you know, their delicacies and fine cuisine were fresh and they didn't have a lot of preservatives. And for some reason I had this word preservative in my head, which is like really technical and not what like a sixth grader should be thinking of. So I didn't really have the word for preservative. Um, so I just kind of made one up, which you shouldn't do. And I made up what I thought the French equivalent was pre for preservative, which is preservatif, which turns out that actually means condoms in French. So I basically told the host family in front of all their friends and family that their food was full of condoms. And um, I definitely made that first impression. So that was amazing. Um, I actually ended up majoring in French in college. So don't worry, the story has a happy ending. But no, I tell that story not only to break the ice and show a bit of vulnerable humanness, um, but also to link kind of a true passion that I think myself and a lot of design ops managers have for connection through inclusivity and through finding common languages with people in my job every day at Capital One and, and in all my previous roles. And if I think about it, most of us as design ops managers kind of do the same things that my goofy preteen self did, where we seek out opportunities to connect by creating a shared language for our design teams every day. So we kind of become these translators, bridging designers in the business, connecting design to tech, kind of like French to English a little bit. We're trying to enable designers to contribute in a way that their partners understand to bring clarity and inclusivity to the way we work, especially within product design organizations in a big company like Capital One. Um, so as you heard Jody was saying, we have, you know, a, over 500 designers and Jason and, um, and myself, well actually myself are in a team of about 80 plus designers. So a lot of the time that we spend or I spend with them is, is coaching these teams on some tools and methods and frameworks to communicate effectively. We're in a highly regulated financial sector where a lot of our stakeholders have different languages of their own, different KPIs, different goals, just different ways of saying things. Um, plus, they don't really teach a ton of that empathy for business or tech in design school. So a lot of my role is kind of bridging those gaps, which is really fun. Inclusivity and finding common languages is probably one of the biggest pain points that have I, I've experienced at Capital One, uh, sorry, in, in all of my um, experience. And I kind of thought this three-legged stool um, model really helped resonate with the goal I tried to, to achieve when I'm working with teams. So I first really understood the stool model when I read an article um, by about Alex Schleffer, who's the VP of design at Airbnb. And he referred to the three-legged stool as create a design-friendly organization in large companies by fusing engineering, product, or sorry, or the business and design, ensuring that each discipline is involved and aligned from a product's inception all the way through to its launch. And even Kristen Skinner and Peter Merholtz also refer to the importance, uh, importance of the three-legged stool in their book, Org Design for Design Orgs. And they note that designers should no longer be handed brief and requirements, but instead of be a part of the conversation earlier to make sure that that empathetic perspective is, present, is represented equally and the reality of contemporary product and service delivery is really messy and requires that kind of productive tension between um, product, uh, the business, you can see the B there, design, the D leg, and, and engineering or tech, which is that T leg there. So just like my stool. 
But it got me thinking about our stool as our current state of play. Are we really combining the business strategy and tech and design in that work core kind of working group like Alex and Kristen were modeling? Are all the legs in our stool the same width? Is there a little bit of wobble? How do we make sure that that three-legged stool model is considered as much as possible in the way that we work? And another thing that I've learned is, is design even ready maturity wise to be equally represented in that leg in the stool? So I'm actually going to pass to Jason to dig a little bit deeper into this um, stool model now. And we're going to do that today. Jason's driving. We're kind of tag teaming the conversation a little bit. So bear with us. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so to expand upon what Daphne was saying, we wanted to talk a little bit about what tips the stool and how we can really write that stool. Um, so your typical sort of product org is made up of those, again, those three legs, your business, design, and tech, and you've got a product owner or a product team that's sort of trying to wrangle all three pieces of that business. And in a typical, or excuse me, in a perfect world, this is what your Venn diagram would look like if there was perfection. Leadership tends to think like this is how it looks and there's, there's a lot of equality across the board. Um, but when we really look more deeply at uh, product organizations, regardless of the company, some, are, some have uh, sort of better situations than others, but usually you know, ratios come into play. Design teams are technically uh, usually a little smaller than their engineering counterparts. And they're also trying to serve those, those business teams with all the questions and places that they have to really dig in deep. In the middle, you've got your product owner trying to, again, keep everyone talking, keeping everyone sort of wrangled and together. And design is really left sort of struggling, kind of jumping back and forth. Like they'll, they'll spend a lot of time with tech one day, maybe business the next. Um, so they're, they're really stretched thin. Um, and then if you don't have a, that product owner in the mix, which some organizations don't, um, you know, that is where you kind of get things that sort of break apart. Um, and even when teams who have product owners, if that owner steps out or takes on a different role or that person leaves the company, you can kind of start to get this drift. So if we bring back, if we bring things back together uh, and zoom in just a little bit, uh, design's job, and really everyone's job within a product team, but we'll just focus on uh, design. Design's job is really to have conversations. And a lot of design teams have conversations in places they know. So they'll have the conversations in the overlap, whether it's with the business, with tech, or with their product partners. But it's usually in a place that's a bit more comfortable. So it's like, here are my wireframes. Let's walk through them based upon those requirements that you gave me. Or I did some user research, and here's the findings to that research. So again, it's in this place of like comfort. But the place that you can really start to make your impact and really have um, uh, influence is if you start to include and find places that have bigger conversations outside of your comfort zone and places that you wouldn't typically have conversations as a designer. And that's where your influence can really start to grow. So as you have those conversations in those places that you're not used to and even your partners aren't used to, that's where your influence really starts to grow. And then over time, what happens is, is you still have those conversations outside of that comfort zone, even though your, your um, influence has grown. And maybe you partner a little bit with HR, so does the business, and then HR talks to finance. Maybe you don't talk to finance, and finance talks to legal. So there's some other parts of the business where you're not actually doing a lot of these conversations. But this really cool things happens, like once you start to meet people where they are versus having them come to you, people start to chatter. And then what happens is, is HR talks to finance, finance talks to legal, and then everybody wants to be having conversations with design. And then that influence grows even more. So I'm gonna hand it off to Daphne to talk about where, where you can have some of those inclusive conversations. Yes, thanks. Um, you want the three-legged stool assembled as early as possible, right? So right from the kickoff, ideating and co-creating from the beginning. And one of the best ways I've seen that happen is when teams use a lean canvas, which is what you're looking at right here. I'm sure you've seen these before. They originated from business canvases, which helped startups analyze strengths and weaknesses of their business model. This one I made here for Capital One about two years ago for a workshop um, that you'll see a little bit more of. 
you can download them from the internet. There's tons of them out there. Literally just Google lean business canvas or just lean canvas. Um, but basically it's a one page document to be filled in by the entire three legged stool team together. And it's focusing on problems, solutions, customers, key metrics, risks, and dependencies. And the great thing about this is it actually helps our business partners focus their products on the customer problems instead of specific features of the product. And I'll get more into that customer side. So traditionally the canvas can be owned, if you will, by product. Um, it doesn't have to be. So anybody that has an idea um, just kind of running around in their head, they can use the canvas as a great kind of first step to kick it off with. But typically at Capital One, our product owners um, try to kick off with this and design will influence um, products and how they use it. So I work a lot with the product partners to kind of have a first attempt at looking at what are some of the things that we're going to talk about in the kickoff um, or the, the workshop or whatever you want to use to, to indoctrinate the team that you're pulling together to, to start problem solving and, and ideating together. And it just helps that first kickoff kind of not just jump onto this big blank canvas, but maybe have people prepared with some metrics, some goals, some KPIs that they probably already have up their sleeves from their manager, um, and maybe like a high level summary for what this idea or project is trying to solve, and most importantly, who for. So the PO usually organizes that one or, um, or maybe one hour, an hour and a half kind of kickoff meeting, assembling that three-legged stool to co-create. So they usually invite design, maybe like a third party like me or a project manager, um, somebody kind of vanilla in the middle that helps kind of break up or mediate a little bit. Um, usually data analysts are, are handy, um, engineering leads at the table. I know it's hard to get developers sometimes their time, so maybe like a tech lead instead. Um, and this can have multiple iterations. So your first round together, you're really going to start to look at, okay, what's the customer value proposition? That's sort of where the, the um, I guess, the beginning of this co-creation co starts. You want to think about what's the problem statement. Um, and usually your product owner kind of has that already. And in the meeting, you're going to work through these areas of the canvas. So first the CVP, then you're going to move into this desirability area. Desirability is um, all about the customer, so we'll get to that in a minute. The next section is the viability area, which is a little bit more the business or product. And then the last piece is the feasibility area, which is really kind of like your tech or um, the actual build of whatever this idea is going to be. So if I start with looking at desirability, which is basically everything about the customer. So this is the first box. Who is the customer? What channels are they coming from? Are they new? Are they existing? The second one is what are the customer problems? And you can move these around however you like. This is just sort of what we started with. And this is a great area for any kind of research that we have. So it helps like show our engineering and product partners, hey, we have some problems that we already know about from our customers, or maybe you have just some hypotheses that you want to throw in here. But um, it's a really great way to introduce research into the process as well. When you move into the viability section, this tends to kind of be a little bit more product and business focused. So the first box is basically around the solutions, what the 2B experience will be for the customer, which is again, very hypothetical. Um, the second box is really all about the business outcomes. This will come a lot from your product or business partner. And these are really clearly defined qualitative business goals. So are we increasing revenue? Are we decreasing operating expenses? percentage of improvement, that type of thing. Um, and the last area, the feasibility section, these are the impacts of can we actually build this? And what are the dependencies that we have? What are the risks? Uh, how complex is this going to be? This tends to be really technically driven. Um, that's part of that kind of getting your tech lead or your engineers um, and usually your product owner in there as well, depending on how technical they are. Some of this could be regulatory things as well. I know working in finance, we have to consider a whole ton of regulations um, in this part of the feasibility. So I'm going to actually take a break and pause here and I'm gonna let a colleague of mine kind of show you how we used this whole um, canvas, the, the workshop and, and getting that three-legged stool to work through this canvas together in a little video. So I'm gonna let Jason see if he can jump onto that. I love tech, here we go. <music> Hi 
there. My name is Klaus Heesch. I'm a product designer and senior manager for Consumer Bank here at Capital One. I'm also design lead for the newly formed customer account management team based here in New York City. I'm on my walk to work and I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you about the all hands meeting that our team had here at the Union Square flagship branch on April 2nd, 2018. Following a day of presentations around pod missions, KPIs, team culture and norms, we participated in a workshop on project definition and prioritization led by two of our incredible design managers, Daphne Bourne and Carolyn Dobbs. Our facilitators grouped designers and product owners from different pods to form dynamic teams. All were tasked with solving a single problem and empowered with a lean UX canvas template. What started out as blank sheets of paper quickly filled up with ideas from each group as our partners ideated and explored solutions. Each idea was viewed through a lens of desirability for the customer, viability for the business, and then weighed against feasibility from a production and tech standpoint. Just over an hour later, the teams synthesized their findings and then took turns sharing out their best solutions. It was incredible to see the range of ideas that were proposed and to hear the sound reasoning used to back them up. And it quickly became clear how effective the process can be in finding the best solutions and prioritizing across the lane. The DVF workshop is just one of the many tools that our teams can deploy to facilitate collaborative problem solving, outside the box thinking, and to make the customer experience the best that it can be. With tools like this and people like these, this team is poised to change banking for good. Well, that worked, so that was great. Cool, all right, I'm gonna pass it to Jason. All right. <clears throat> so uh, next up, we're gonna talk about crafting healthy teams. Let me get my slides to work, there we go. <clears throat> so where can you really find inclusion? Um, so uh, I've done a lot of research around this and I've got six points I'm gonna cover off on. Um, first one being around community. Um, I find that if you really understand the skills, uh, the different teams you're working with and all those disciplines, that goes a long way in really knowing where to find that inclusion. Uh, a lot of times teams overlook these things. Uh, once you're hired, it's like, oh, you know, Sally or, or Bob came in the door. They, you know, they're on this team. These are their skills and they never really revisit those things. But if you can go back and constantly have a pulse on those things, you can really use those to your advantage to know where to find inclusion. Uh, another thing uh, is principles or, or pillars, uh, sort of a core set of guiding um, uh, things that help uh, you understand why we're here or, or why we're doing um, uh, why we're doing this for our for our customers. Um, a lot of organizations will have these, or sometimes they'll have many of them. Um, that's another big thing to keep in mind is like you know like what are the core ones? Uh, I can speak at Capital One. Like product has their own. Design has had their own, tech has had their own. So a lot of times that can cause confusion. So it's good to really have a, a core set of um, principles that you can all stand behind. Uh, next are your systems and assets. So when I talk about that, I talk about the, the design systems that you use, if you have one, um, the assets you use to, to create things, whether it's this lean business canvas, or if you're creating wireframes or screen designs, um, you know, uh, guidelines around content strategy, all those kinds of things are, are really key so that you're not, one, creating those things from scratch every single time, or you're not, um, you know, keeping this sense of consistency across your um, uh, experience. Um, next is, oh, Daph, this is you. Yeah, so 
This is a, an interesting one. So this is content that Jason and I have talked about um, for a while now. And we got to the co-location and I was like, well, this might need a bit of tweaking with COVID. Um, and we actually really just thought, you know, now is the time to kind of take a look at whatever your co-location strategy was before. Um, maybe you didn't have one. Maybe now you want to put one together and look at how you've maybe pivoted or shifted some of those office norms. Um, I know for Capital One, because we are all over the country, working remotely is actually just kind of part of our DNA. So a lot of our tools and hardware and software is kind of inbuilt into us. Like we use Zoom completely, you know, just, just every, every single minute of the day, I feel like I'm on Zoom calls um, before COVID. And we use a lot of great collaborative tools like Mural, where we can do real-time sharing. Um, obviously, we use Slack, not just for a Giphy war, but, you know, for really staying connected. Um, but all of that's important as well. Like even, you know, just having that kind of normalcy and, and being able to be human and humorous and connect with um, with your even your tech partners, your design team, whomever, um, just making sure that you have kind of a strategy on on how you want to, I guess, maybe change or look at what um, what your new norms are going to be like as a team, especially during now. Um, collaboration, this is obviously one of my favorites. So having those frameworks, you know, the tool like the canvas methods, anything that's going to encourage, um, I guess, problem definition or problem solving as a, um, a collaborative team outside of design is always really crucial, I think, for that inclusion of a healthy team and kind of creating that empathy with your partners um, and hearing what's important to them. So kind of understanding what like tech or engineering or business are on the hook for as part of going through those exercises like the canvas is, is really helpful and, and helps craft that kind of healthy um, inclusivity and ensuring you've got the right people in the room at the right time working on the right things is just magic. So I think that one's really important. And the last one is rituals. I mean, all of this stuff is awesome, but rituals kind of keep those wheels greased, right? So it affords us the connectivity at kind of like a regular cadence and the inclusion and that kind of cohesion and that common language. If we're having a nice, really healthy um, way of demoing or giving status updates, whether it be daily or weekly or whatever it is, however you're critiquing the work or sharing the work through some kind of ritual um, that's habitual and kind of just part of, you know, it's like brushing your teeth. You just do it every day. Um, that's really going to help craft that kind of healthy team and healthy inclusion. Inclusion. Um, and sometimes they may not feel like they're actually being productive and that's totally fine. You know, we spent um, a lot of time in the beginning of the COVID work from home kind of shake up, reevaluating our rituals to see if they're still working. And if they're not, that's great. They're not written in stone. You can take a look at them, pulse check them and iterate and try something new. So um, I encourage you to flip up a ritual as as often as you like. I mean, give it a nice week, like six week kind of bracket to see how it's embedding, but maybe at the end, give it a pulse check and see if it's actually working for everybody through like a retro, which is another great ritual that I love. Um, cool, what is next? I love, Jason's animations are my favorite. Oh, this is this is your bit, Jason. This is your yeah. jam, you love this. Um, yeah, thanks, Daph. Uh, so next up is uh, perceptions and behaviors and breaking that cycle. Um, it took me many years in my career to figure this out, and it wasn't until we had some really great leadership training at Capital One where a bunch of light bulbs went off um, uh, in my head, at least, at least for me. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is, um, you know, you're sort of, you're confronted every day with everyone's behaviors, whether it's yours or others, and it's always situational. Um, and the other part about that is which there are these perceptions around those behaviors and those are yours and others view of what reality is. And it's kind of this vicious cycle. Like, you know, you've got these behaviors, there are these perceptions, which then breed other behaviors. And it's this sort of vicious cycle. Um, and sometimes it can get to a place where, you know, conversations can get really difficult or there are partners you don't want to work with or for, um, or you really can't just move things forward. And two things that I've really uh, sort of nailed down and at least have helped me over the last couple of years at Capital One to make, to make progress 
is really impacting others' behaviors. And that really starts with inclusion and inviting as many people as possible and inviting the right people to things. And that can really start to impact others' behaviors. People can start to feel like they're included, like they belong to the team. Um, I've always been really big about bringing folks along to, to meetings regardless of title. I've had managers in the room with MVPs. I think it's really important to have a really diverse team uh, as far as uh, across the board, especially when it comes to, to things like background, experience, all those things play a huge role in really impacting folks' um, behaviors. And the last piece is really impacting perceptions. So as you kind of swing from the behaviors into that um, perceptions piece where you can really start to, to sort of change people's perceptions, I found is really questioning your own ego. Like everyone comes to a conversation, a situation, whatever, and they've got their own understanding of things. And it's really, um, it's painted in a light where uh, it's, it's really about them. Like if you go into a room and you're gonna show wireframes for an, at this hour and a half meeting, um, you're going into it with your ego. You, you think these things are the right solution. You spend a lot of time on it. There's all these things that are really impacting as you go in um, to these certain situations. So the more you can question and sort of, you know, hold back on, on any, um, any preconceived notions or sort of feelings that you have about things, that's the other place you can really start to break down any bad behaviors or bad perceptions. So next we'll talk about uh, behavioral impact. Uh, this one we're gonna kind of pose a stick back and forth on. Um, one of the big things that I've uh, really noticed, especially in the last two jobs in my career, is to really avoid clicks. Um, the more that you hang on to inner circles um, or, you know, close friends or people you get along with, whatever it may be, um, that's where you can start to have some of those negative impacts. So the more that you can avoid those clicks, avoid those inner circles, um, the more that you can start to see a lot sort of better uh, inclusivity and a lot better outcomes come with, within your work. Um, obviously, I'm going to take the language matters one. Uh, no, but I, I really think that um, obviously that was part of like my entire story in the beginning, right? Finding that common ground and finding some sameness in how we can communicate and pushing for inclusivity with even the way that we title projects. I remember we were talking to our product teams being like, can we not title our projects like WRXK? You know, it sounds like a droid from the Star Wars. No offense, Jason, I, I know you're a mad Star Wars fan, but maybe something that actually is a bit more human and kind of makes sense for everybody. Um, reducing acronyms as much as possible, just even how we've named our teams, um, even how we've rebranded our, um, our entire design org within Capital One. Um, we're all, all these little like tiny details of how we say things is a really nice um, kind of like connective tissue to make sure that we have, I guess, a little bit more of that sameness and we're not excluding people with the way that we're, we're speaking about things that might be like, oh, I'm not sure what she's talking about there. Um, and it, it's noted by your partners all the time and it's noted by even more junior designers to see how you speak more inclusively um, and, and how we just talk day to day about things at work. Nice. Uh, next up is continuing education. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of hiring smart people and then finding the places where there's smart people can train other folks. Um, I think uh, I can speak to at least more recently with, within the bank design team. We've got a few folks across the team who are really good at like information architecture, uh, animation, um, content strategy, things of that nature. And um, we have found ways to empower those folks to teach others. So there's a, a gentleman who's uh, in, the, in the bank design team, his name's Ryan, he's really good with, with motion design. And he came to me one day and he's like, hey, he's like, I, you know, I was looking at all of our animations across our experiences. They were all over the place. I really like to find a way to like, you know, be more cohesive about, about motion and, and that stuff with, within our apps. And I was like, cool, like you should talk to our, our design system team, Gravity, and put together a plan for how you want to teach people. And he's like, you want me to teach people? And I was like, well, yeah, like no one else knows animation on the team as well as you do. So you should be the one to teach other people. Um, so over the course of, I guess, four to six weeks, he put together a pretty good plan and pitched it to Gravity. Uh, Gravity invited him in to actually be a contributing member. And he's actually defining a lot of the motion design within our Gravity design system now. 
And on top of that, he's now going back into the business, not just in bank, but other lines of business, actually teaching folks about different animation tools like Lottie um, and just sort of how you can approach design and make it uh, a very emotional thing when you start to enter, um, introduce motion into those uh, things that you're actually creating for, for customers. Um, comfortable and safe space. So this is huge for our design teams. Um, I know at Capital One, we talk a lot about how introverts um, can fit and feel comfortable with engaging with, I mean, it's so hard. You're in the middle of a big corporate environment where there's, you know, your engineer kind of tapping on your shoulder. You don't get to be in your kind of warm, snug living room. Well, now you do, but um, so I think also having safe spaces virtually for people. So we have things like design reviews where we have a regular cadence and we make sure that there's a lot of psychological safety and a lot of comfort and um, a lot of, uh, I guess, empathy with understanding, let's make a framework for a design review so people understand how to critique, um, what are no-goes, what's a better way of saying this, and then giving people the language and giving people kind of like the fundamentals of critiquing so that when people go to share, they want to share, they understand what's going to be coming at them, they understand what they're going to be getting out of it. So I guess just giving some more clarity around those spaces that are really kind of vulnerable, specifically design reviews, um, and making sure that there's a ton of psychological safety in there. And next is uh, empowering community. Um, uh, one of the things I really found early on uh, in the last couple of jobs, and definitely within, within Capital One is around uh, letting folks sort of build their own community. I've definitely uh, heard, the, heard the spiel from upper management and other jobs where they're like, you know, we've created this great culture. Why is no one latching on? And I, I find myself asking the question like, um, well, did you create the culture or did the folks within the company create that culture? Um, so one of the, th the things I did probably within the first six months or so at Capital One, uh, one of the designers in our ATM lane, Danielle Simpson came to me and she's like, you know, there's all these little pockets of things happening and like, we're not really consistent with like, you know, celebrating people's birthdays or recognizing people like when they do launches, I'd, I'd like to really, you know, find a way to do that. And I said, well, you know, are there other people that want to do this with you? And she said, yeah, there's about five other people that, that want to do this. Um, and uh, I said, well, you know, let me know what you're thinking. I come back with a budget and we'll see what we can do. So she came back about two weeks later, gave me this massive spreadsheet. Like she did budgets better than I could. And um, so uh, we, we set her and about four or five, four or five other people loose and, um, we got into this great cadence of really making people feel like they belong. Um, and we actually did it not just in our office in 1750 in Tyson's, but in all the offices. So we set up and sort of operationalized this notion of community across, uh, across the board. And basically said, you know, these are the eight things that we're always gonna recognize across the team, but each location can do it in a way that best supports their people. And doing so that really has helped with uh, um, attrition in the team, it's helped with, you know, morale, all those other kinds of things. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great ad just to see folks like really enjoy coming into work every day. And the last thing I saw before we, uh, before we sort of the office closed down, we now have this sort of hallmark birthday card rack. So you can come in and you can, you can do, you know, greeting cards, welcome cards, whatever you want, depending on the um, situation that's happening that week or, or, or for a certain person. This is me. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, great. This is me. Um, so letting process bubble up. I remember speaking at a, um, a design ops conference a few years ago and they were like, I heard another speaker come up before me and I was like, no, don't say it. And she said it don't ever impose a process on the team. And I was like, oh, that's what I do every day. No, um, but she had a really good point. Um, finding those organic and kind of natural processes and, and workflows and ways of doing things um, organically rather than like, I am Daphne Born and I'm gonna come in here and tell you how to do stuff. We have a little bit of that, but it's really, really, really flexible. And the way that we got there was actually piloting a ton of stuff. So we love a pilot. 
pilot's like my favorite thing. We did a JIRA pilot, which went for six weeks. It ended up actually going for like four or five more months because um, they loved it so much. But having a, a kind of way to like, let's try this, let's pulse check it, and then let's iterate it. And if it's working, let's share it out and see if people, you know, kind of, I guess, have the appetite for it as well. And that's how we've actually created some of our, our best best um, best practices and standards is by letting everybody have a go, playing with it, iterating it, kind of feeling out the awkwardness and then iterating it and making it like our, our new gold standard. So instead of me coming in and saying, we are all gonna do the British Design Council double diamond and that's just how it is, really letting us um, sort of, I guess, craft it our way um, and pilot it out as much as possible. Ooh. This is, this is you. Is this you? Oh, this is you. This is me. Yeah. Great. I knew that. Um, so the team operating model. So there are obviously key players to help champion all of these models, all of these concepts and practices we've gone over today, right? And we, I say we, there's a royal we, um, have found, and really it's Jason. He's the, he's the genie, he's the brains behind this whole charade have found the most effective combination for our design operations team is by having advocates for each area. I think sometimes companies hire design managers or design operations people to try to do all of the things, recruitment, finance, um, like people happiness, uh, program management, all in one poor little design manager. And that's a lot. And also I hate finance. So I'm just gonna like not do that as much as I wanna do process stuff. Um, so Jason has had this amazing idea of finding out what our passions were. Um, and there, there, at the time there were three of us. I think there's about nine of us now, which is amazing. So um, we found that if we really focused on our particular, um, I guess, areas of expertise and kind of advocate for those, we could get really deep and way more, um, I guess, create way more impact and be way more effective when we are trying to implement new ideas um, and, and try to embed some of these models and principles. So I'll start with my area first, which is kind of the portfolio or program management area. Um, and, you know, my jam, obviously, is everything you've heard. So early intent, I love working with um, teams to define that desirability, viability, feasibility piece. A lot of people have heard it. They just don't know how to like get in there and, and define it and kind of organize it. So that's one of my favorite things is bringing that super early in the piece um, so that it doesn't kind of trickle in later. Process mapping and education. Again, what I was just talking about, letting the process bubble up, finding out what's working for the teams, um, trying not to like mandate things, but really um, when I do standardize and evangelize things, it's because as a team, we kind of all had a little bit of a, a say in, in what the best way um, for us works as a process. Um, and rather than just me enforcing it all the time. And measuring and reporting, obviously, it, you know, we need to have a finger on the pulse of how we're working, right? And making sure that our teams are healthy and happy and, and growing and their careers are developing. Um, and if our portfolio is healthy and if we're prioritizing the right work and we're working on the right prioritized work, you know, we're not working on something that our product partner is like, I don't, you don't need to worry about that. I really need you to worry about this. Um, so if we're making sure that we have a really good practice of measuring how all of those things are going. Um, it's a great way to make sure that everybody is clear and aligned on what we're working on and leadership is aware of all of the statuses. So we have a ton of, um, we have like a team of teams that we created and implemented, which is always getting iterated because it's a really fun meeting to have. Um, and we have a portfolio um, cadence and portfolio actually like an asset, literally like a deck that we have a, a regular cadence of working through with our product team and with our design leaders. Um, and it helps give that security and that confidence to the team that there's transparency in everything that we're, we're measuring and we're reporting on. So nothing kind of is just simmering in the corner, but it's being addressed. Um, and we can still always show the value of design to our C-levels if we've got some good metrics um, and ways of, of capturing all of that hard work. So that's me. 
Thanks, Dad. Uh, the second piece is people operations. Um, right now, this is run by a person on our, our team, Noel, who's actually in New York and sits, I think, a seat or two, or did sit a seat or two away from Daphne. Um, people operations is really critical to the happiness of any team, making sure people have what they need to really get their jobs done uh, throughout the year and really from day one um, up until they actually, uh, actually leave the company. And uh, we actually had one uh, associate who left the company, moved to Seattle, and it was literally three weeks before tax time. And they reached out over Instagram to me and they were like, um, my W-2 is incorrect. What do I do? And we quickly jumped in and helped her get in contact with HR so she could get a new, a new W-2. So those are the kinds of things that, that Noel focuses on. Um, the big real, the three real, really large things she focuses on is uh, recruiting the right talent. So that is um, uh, making sure we have tight job descriptions that are consistent. Um, and she's empowering design leads with, uh, with, with proper intent. Um, one, of the, one of the big things when it comes to recruiting is uh, a lot of times organizations, they might not have job descriptions ready to go or as the organization evolves, like a principal associate today is not a principal associate six months later or a principal associate on one team is not the same as another team. Those are things that we try to avoid so that uh, designers can uh, sort of flow throughout the business. And if you're a principal associate in card and you wanna go to bank, you, you know, those same expectations will, will actually be there. So you're not jumping into a role that's less or more of what you came into. Uh, the other thing is around developing our people. So again, we talked a little bit about empowering the smartest people to, to, to teach others and fill the gaps with professional education. We have a ton of learning groups within Capital One, just around motion design, content strategy, research. People are always sharing all the things they're learning and uh, that the smartest people are really um, you know, showing up to the table and having a lot of fun educating others on these little uh, sort of niche areas of design that they're really great at. And on top of that, we also, um, and I think any organization should do this, is find ways for um, professional development outside the scope of, of your everyday work life. So whether that's conferences or training, um, and nowadays um, uh, with, with COVID, uh, one of the bright sides to it is a lot of these conferences have gone virtual, so it's easier to, to attend conferences. Uh, last but not least, uh, with people with building culture, so again, empowering side of desk um, uh, community across all teams and all locations. And this isn't just exclusive to design, it should be really inclusive of your partners. So as you start to really let that community bubble up, make sure you're including everyone um, in the mix. And then the last piece is practice operations. Um, so this is, this is kind of the, the meat of what we do as designers. Uh, and Daphne talked about this a little bit earlier. So developing practice rigor. So it's really working with the craft experts in your team to document, you know, what makes up an actual community of practice. Capital One, we have a lot of COPs. Uh, there's the design manager community of practice. There's a content strategy community of practice. Uh, there's a research one. There's, I've, I've lost count of all the COPs that there are. But it's really great because it's that tight team of folks that are experts in their thing who are defining at Capital One what research should look like, what content should look like, and then they share those things out with the rest of the design team to set those standards. Uh, that segues into sharing all the knowledge. So again, working inside and outside of talent management cycles to teach and grow. So at Capital One, talent management is held twice a year. It's sort of squished between performance management. It's when we really talk about how we make people grow. Um, and one of the things in, in, Cap, uh, excuse me, in, in Bank that we did was find ways to sort of help and teach each other. There was a lot of conversations as we went through talent, uh, talent management with our Manager Plus community. We would offer up someone on our team like, oh, that person wants to learn more how to do project management. Well, they should partner with Brisbane on Daphne's team. Or this person wants to learn more about animation. Well, they should partner with Ryan so they can learn more about animation. So again, like, you know, finding the places where, where folks can uh, sort of learn from each other to make the practice stronger. And then uh, last but not least, again, Daph talked about this a little earlier, it's just physical and digital spaces. Um, I'm someone that um, uh, worked with Jody for a time at Eight Shapes, uh, five years I worked um, remotely. So every job since then, I've always tried to, to set up design in a manner where it could work physically in a space or it could work if you were from your home office. 
Um, so uh, one of the things we did at Capital One was quickly try to get uh, mural in so we could do virtual whiteboarding uh, and making sure we just had the tools that allowed us to work from really anywhere. Um, and then we also did have the physical spaces that allowed us to, to have great conversations. We had a couple places within our 1750 location where we had tons of foam core board and people would print stuff out and do service blueprinting and all kinds of other crazy stuff, um, which is really great because it also gave some visibility into our work. We made sure that the work was placed strategically on different floors so it was near some of our higher level executives so they could see the work that we were working on and see the value that we were adding to the business. So those three pieces, um, line up again, portfolio operations, people operations, and practice operations. Um, this is one place where the Venn diagram at least comes together to look perfect. Um, so when that comes together at the center of all that, our customer as a design manager is the designer. Like it does affect the downstream customer outside the business, but at the end of the day, we're there to, to serve the designers and make them more efficient at what they do. And then the overlap of these three circles um, is where we have these sort of secondary pieces of the diagram. So between people operations and portfolio operations, we have competencies. So uh, Daphne, as she tracks the work, she starts to see what talent is working on what, whether you have a lot of visual designers working on something, interaction designers, researchers. And then as we start to identify gaps, uh, someone like Noel and people operations can find ways to educate folks or we're seeing the gaps and people need training uh, she can find opportunities inside and outside the company to level people's skills up. The next place is around co-location. Daphne talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, my strategy around co-location has always been, you know, again, making it so people can really work from, uh, from anywhere, whether it's in an office with each other or from home with each other. Um, so again, between the people and practice piece, making sure you have practices in place that enable you to either co-locate in a building or be remote in wherever you are and um, making sure that people have you know, safe spaces and all the things that they need to actually do that. And then the last piece of overlap is um, collaboration. So between that portfolio and practice piece, as Daphne's doing a lot of the, the tracking and, and reporting of the work, she's seeing how people are working together. That in turn defines how we work as a practice. And we can really start to define and put on paper how we either work as individual teams or at a high level, how we work as one big team. And then we can report that back to our partners so they can better understand what design does. So three takeaways. So the first one is uh, again, finding inclusion. Look for the places that have conversations in other organizations. Again, it's always gonna be comfortable to have conversations uh, with your peers on design, or even if it's going to your partners and you're showing things that are things you created, um, or things that you're sort of, you're, are in your wheelhouse of comfort. But you really find inclusion when you have conversations outside of that in places that design doesn't normally show up. So segueing perfectly off of that is framework. Um, that's exactly what I did with the Lean Canvas when I got to Capital One. I found a framework, I found a tool that I guess was addressing that finding inclusion early outside of design. So selling that into my product and tech partners as a way to better partner with design um, and doing that as early as possible in the process. Um, so find a tool maybe that you know or that you've seen or borrow the Lean Canvas, um, or make your own Lean Canvas or anything else and um, see if you can use that as a um, a leverage to get in with with other teams as well or other parts of your organization. And the last takeaway is perceptions and behaviors. Again, the big thing is questioning your own ego, like why am I coming to this meeting or why am I inviting these people? You know, what, uh, what preconceived notions or perceptions do I have? What is my reality going into this? Uh, as long as you can really deeply understand that, you can show up and have better conversations uh, especially with folks in the room that may not be in the same skill set as you, or maybe uh, are, are new to, to design and what it is you really bring to the business. Oh my gosh. So I feel like, look at our stool. It's happy again. Yay. It's feeling a bit stronger. 
that design leg is a bit more equally weighted to the business and tech. We've got that productive tension that we're looking for. We've got some clarity in our work. We've got clarity in what our teams are needing to feel included. We feel heard and seen in our roles. We're hearing other types of roles and understanding them, communicating, influencing, checking our ego. We're now like this collaborative equal partner, including that the right people for inception with our Canvas work um, and really turning up as that trusted advisor. So we've earned our equal leg in the stool, which I think is really exciting. Um, and that pretty much wraps up our talk for today. So thanks for listening. And I think we've got a ton of questions in the chat. We do. I've been kind of noting on the side here. Definitely, thank you for doing that, but I got you covered. Uh, so ah. Jason, thank you so much for, for the awesome talk. I have some, we have some great questions coming from a wide variety of folks here. So we'll start off with one. This is from Sarah. Where does UX research come into play with the Lean Canvas? And more importantly, has UX research been done before the exercise of doing a Lean Canvas meeting? Um, great question. Yeah, it, it can be either. Um, sometimes we would kick off with a Canvas workshop and realize there has either the research that we have might be super old or outdated or we don't have any. And it was like that perfect moment for all of us in the room to say, actually, we need to take some time to do some research. And products are like, oh, we don't have time. And tech's like, I don't know what's research. But now you've got the empathy of your stool hearing, hey, as design, this is, this is necessary. If we don't do research, here's a risk. And that actually answers somebody else's question. That could be a risk to whatever you're trying to solve or, or deliver or produce, whether it be a service or a product. Um, and that's a perfect time to use that second box as um, what kind of research do we have or what kind of research don't we have? So it's a perfect way to, to capture that. That's great. And you actually just covered right on the next question, which is around, what do you mean by risks? So thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, uh, so the follow-up question actually for the first one, which is great, which is uh, also, is there any market research presented to assess the desirability and size of the problem slash need? So market research is great. And that's probably what your product partner might be bringing. I don't know, design might have some great market research as well from some strategic work that they've done or any other research, but market research probably falls more in the V, in the viability section. We try to keep the D really just focused on customer. So that's where that UX or customer research might be coming into play rather than the market research. So market research is great, and it'll probably feed into maybe that KPI area or maybe even to the solutions or maybe even into the risk. You could say, hey, I know that our competitors already have this. And if we don't jump on this and get it out the door, we risk being behind or we risk, you know, not being a bank that doesn't have X service or X product. And now it's expected by our customers. Um, so market research is probably a bit more of that V than so, the D. That's perfect. Thank you. And I think you have touched on this a little bit. And, and so I'm going to unpack this a little bit. So how do you check for design feasibility with the tech team? And what is the best feedback loop during development? Yes. Managed? I saw that. So design fees, I kind of wanted to know a little bit more what design feasibility means. I don't know if anybody who ever asked that, like, feel, can they unmute themselves? Can they, or maybe chat? Sure. Or, I don't know. Um, yeah, that was me, Sarah. Um, so like sometimes when tech is implementing, um, a design, they come across like roadblocks, like we're not coming up with the right tech solution to support this design or, um, this design is a little wonky. Um, so, um, like it's not working the way that you may have imagined or intended it to work. So where do you get that feedback loop um, from the developers? And is there a process that you have ongoing to communicate and ensure that your designs are working out the way that you intended them to work out? Yes, yes. that is an awesome question. Thank you. Um, the design feasibility, I should have said something. I didn't get to go super deep in the, into the canvas. I, I can do a whole nother talk on that if you guys want. Um, but part of 
the canvas is it can be an iterative process. You could have that kickoff and not have enough information that tech needs to assess the feasibility at that time. So you might say, this is what we're thinking and tech's in the room going, uh, I don't know if we can build that. Can we come back to you in like a day or two and look a little bit deeper into what we need? And you're like, cool. So sometimes those canvas workshops might have like one or two or three rounds. It can be a living document like that. And that's ideally why you want to do it super early. So you can kind of untangle any of those bugs or wrinkles or worries that tech might have with whatever design is saying. Because whatever design is saying in the room, tech might be listening and being like, I don't think we can build that. Or, you know, they might be like, oh, that's easy. We can totally build that. Um, the feedback loop is a great question. We have been trying to, and we've been doing it in, in bits and pieces. I wouldn't say 100%, 100% across the board, but we try to work in dual track agile, which means we are usually design is trying to do all of that discovery and early part, like almost the first diamond, if you will, um, part of the design process before we hand anything over to tech. So um, that way, and, but you've already had these conversations with tech, right? So they're not, there's no surprise when you start handing stuff over to them. That's what the cool part of the canvas is. You've had those conversations early. They've been a part of it. They're like, cool, I know what design's thinking of. I might kind of come back to that. And then when it's time to hand it over to them, you should have a nice little handover process. If you don't, I think it's important. And then when they're in the build stage, they're now at that second track where you're kind of in support mode, right? So you're, you should be there saying, hey, developer, I, I'm not going to be designing at the same time as you because now I'm moving on to the next piece while you're designing kind of what I just did two weeks ago. Sorry if this is confusing. Um, but I'm here to support that build. So I can be, we can have office hours, we can have um, Slack chats to help you through that build. Um, and, and have those kind of quality checks along the way. So I would embed that in the process early. Um, okay, good. You're like, okay, I've got it, Daph, stop talking. <laughs> Jason, is there anything? I know you love that that question too, if I've left anything out. No, I, I, think, I think you nailed it, it's good. Cool. Great, on to the next question. Some good stuff here that's coming through. It's coming fast and furious. I just want to make sure, uh, Jason, Daphne, how much time do you guys have for, for q and I got all day. I'm kidding. Yeah. Same. Cool. It's, well, it's, we have, well, right now we got about six or seven or so questions and a couple more coming through. So we'll, we'll try to be out for that. And thank you everyone for participating and, and continuing on to, to bring on those questions. So next one. Um, uh, this is coming from Grayson. He mentioned that I went to GA's UX Immersive Bootcamp and, and uh, now just starting a small startup and an internship. Congratulations. So he's now actually, so he mentioned, I'm actually in charge of a UX research. I was thinking to do that online due to COVID. What is part of the Capital One's best practice for that right now, doing UX research online? Uh, <laughs> um, we have really nice, fancy labs. Um, uh, we actually have labs in all of our locations. So when COVID hit, it definitely shook us and how we usually do things is we bring participants in. We've got these six figure labs that are, are just, I mean, really nicely out, outfitted. Um, but the nice thing is we had a lot of virtual tools in place like usertesting.com. Um, so it actually allowed us to, to, to pivot pretty quickly. And a lot of our legal processes and risk processes around getting signatures and forms and all that, it's, it's, all, done, it's all done digitally and virtually. Um, so really the only thing that changed was um, our, our recruiting method changed a bit. Instead of having um, our research ops folks um, doing the, the actual recruiting, we're now doing a mix of that and um, having um, uh, user testing giving us uh, some of those people. And the other thing um, that has really changed is uh, it's really critical now that we uh, have really good transcriptions. So uh, I can't remember if, if everyone was on when I mentioned this earlier, but like we use Zoom to do all the recordings. We've always done that. So again, that's something that hasn't changed. Um, but with Zoom, it has built in transcription. So that is something that we've now had to rely a bit more heavily on because not everyone can be on the Zoom. 
Um, there's a lot of things around privacy that we have to take into account, like um, technically folks can't see our faces. There's all kinds of things that are, are in the mix legally that we had to shift around. Again, being a big, a big regulated bank, <laughs> those are things we have to face. But um, again, I think tools like um, uh, usertesting.com is a good solution. I think there's a tool called Lookback, I believe it's called, that does user testing and, and transcriptions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's that's how we've at least pivoted to it. And we've left with uh, our user researchers who are used to physical spaces have actually also pivoted and are, are still just as useful now as they were when, when we had actual physical spaces and actually probably a little less stressed than they used to be. That's cool. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, and the, and the folks were actually chiming in too. The mission, folks mentioned user Zoom, DSCAP, a little more qualitative in depth um, uh, research. So that's great. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. So um, how do you implement code design slash development? So how do you code design and develop at the same time? What was your what, what was your process from an operation standpoint to do uh, design and development at the same time? Do you guys do that? Ooh, design development at the same time. Code design. Yeah, development. yeah we have we have pockets of it. So uh, one of the things I've been trying to to coax our leader into doing is having more front end engineers or front end developers. Um, we've got a couple in the team. Um, and we have some designers who were hungry and wanted to learn to code. Um, uh, actually, when I worked with Jody at Eight Shapes is when I learned to code and design. And for a time at Eight Shapes, we were probably two years, at least uh, that Jody and I were there. All we did was went from paper to HTML, CSS. So we have a couple teams at Capital One that do that. Those teams are a little bit mature in that sense of they know that they're going to ship to a, a design system like Gravity. So they've got front end developers that, that build out all their, all their things. So um, in the case of the um, ATM or the machines lane, um, they have a, a guy named uh, Ashe who works with all the designers to, um, uh, to, to crank things out. So they sometimes will sketch things on paper and he'll jump straight into code or other times if it's newer, uh, newer designs, they'll actually jump into sketch or whatever first so they can get it a little bit more polished before they hand it off. Um, and where that's really benefited them is, is they now have a subsystem of gravity called Beast, which is the entire like ATM machine experience. So when you walk up and use a Capital One ATM, that's a, a whole design system that was built and maintained by, by this one person. Um, and uh, what it's really helped with is it enables, it enables us to like actually test a real thing so instead of it being a bunch of Envision prototypes all like stitched together or Figma or whatever your, your flavor is, um, uh, Ashe is actually able to, to take the actual real thing and we make those tweaks and we can set it up on, a, on an iPad and bring in customers and they can actually click through and, and use the interface. Um, and he's actually been able to find a way to, to generate fake data so it actually looks like a real experience without having any compromised customer data in there. That's such a good point in terms of the information that's displayed and testing should feel as real as possible. That's fantastic. That's really cool that you guys were able to bring in like, like tangible fake data. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, so next question, um, how do you change the approach to kickoffs to be more collaborative and co-creative when the existing mm. workflow is very top down from the product work at this time? Mm. That is a tricky one. That has probably been my two years <laughs> at Capital One. Um, I have pitched and done, I, I don't countless like lunch and learns and side of desk uh, little like one man band shows of the lean canvas and of the process of how it works. And there's also, again, I didn't have a ton of time to do it, but I'm more than happy to do another talk on it. There's a second part to the lean canvas, which is actually running like a formula over the top of it to, um, uh, what is it? I guess, create a way to prioritize lean canvases against each other. So it was a way that um, I worked in an agile release train here for an Australian bank. And the only way you could get work into the train was by starting with a lean canvas. 
so it, it, it has to be adopted from like a top down perspective, right? It has to be the executives understand the um, value of the tool, the value of the process. So when I showed them the canvas, they were like, yeah, cool. We know how to use those. We kind of already have this other system that we're doing, but whatever. But then when I showed them the DVF formula, which um, again, I can talk about another time, that then creates um, relativity to that piece of work against other pieces of work, they like leaned in and they were like, oh, this can make my life easier. So I think kind of finding what the pain points were, and for us, it was prioritization. So because we have people, I don't even know where, executive red phones, buttons, whatever that they're pressing that just kind of dump stuff on some of our product partners desks. They don't have a way to go, that's not important right now, or, and they just take it. And when I showed the product teams a way to be able to prioritize with the canvas, they were like, this could save my life here. This could make me have more clout to say, sorry, executive, but if I can show you, you know, the relativity of this work and what is a priority for us with this canvas, awesome. So I think maybe finding the pain point um, and trying to sell it in as high as you can. Um, I remember when I first sold it to our VP, Melissa, she was like, DVF, isn't that like a wrap dress? from Diane von Furstenberg, I've heard of DVF. And I was like, no, no, no. So um, I think really explaining, I guess, what's in it for them. So finding those pain points from the higher ups and then saying, you know, if we can get this tool implemented super early in the process with that three-legged stool, it's gonna save us time. It's gonna help our prioritization, right? So maybe finding some of those, um, pain points to take off would really help. Um, and yeah, and I guess really selling it into the other partners because design was like, yeah, that's great. We want, we want a ticket to the, to the table. You know, we want something that's going to get us in the door. Um, so I, I think design was all over it. It's just selling in your, your partners and, and the executives on the process and what it's going to afford them. That's a great point. Does that answer the question? I'm really waffly today. Sorry. I hope that was okay. Hi, somewhat. Um, I think. Tell me more. Would love to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I fear it's more of a, a cultural issue in that product is seen as the leaders and the people that make decisions and that design is purely executional sure. um, and, and is not seen as a strategic partner. And so, like I, I've done like lots of worksheets and, and workshops before in other roles. Um, so I know the value of them and, and I see them as incredibly valuable, valuable collaboration tools. But I fear that my product org would just see them as another step and therefore a delay to getting a spec out the door or getting an engineer to start coding. Sure. Yeah. It's a really good point. And it was exactly why, and Jason can attest to this, my first six weeks at Capital One was that video that you saw. That was me, literally, I like just got mm. there. And I remember I was trying to get to know the designers. And then I started hearing, I said, well, where do we get our briefs from? Like, how, what's the process here? You know, tell me how we get work. Is it through Slack? Do you have meetings? Like, what is it? And it was really subservient at the time. It was very much like, well, product kind of just tells us what to do and we just execute. So they weren't comfortable flexing this assertive kind of mm -hmm. consultative muscle that they had. They just haven't been using it enough. And as soon as I gave them a tool to be able to have the cool thing of the canvas is that the customer is equally weighted against business and tech, which is rare. Sometimes you find these awesome prioritization tools and it's all about how much money you're going to make and how it's going to help the business. And if tech can build it and the customer is like, Nye. and the cool mm -hmm. thing about the canvas is the customer is totally, it's a democratic approach to making sure that whatever we're building, everybody's had a say, 
it's early. And again, you can do like as many of those as you want. Like we did, um, yeah, we would have like two or three of those works and we'd, we'd come back to the canvas and we'd make sure that everybody felt comfortable. And the point was to say, hey tech, if you're early in on this conversation, there's gonna be no gotchas later, right? We're gonna save you some time and some stress and some headache by letting you in early to a conversation that you probably don't wanna have. And like, I don't know what design's talking about, but also having me, this kind of vanilla, I'm not a designer, I'm not tech and I'm not product, having me help facilitate that workshop could also make sure that everybody had an equal voice. Mm -hmm. And the cool part, and I didn't get to it, was once we did the canvas, we would then sit back and have 15 minutes at the end and we would rate it from the D, the V and the F perspective. And the D was for design's moment to say, I feel that this idea that we've come up with or early stages is confidence level of a five. You, you know, you can use like a Fibonacci scale, maybe to 13, don't go too high because then it just gets silly. Um, and I, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it an eight because I think it's great. And I feel like I've really had my say here and you guys have heard all the things that are important to me. We need research or we have research, whatever it is. And then you're like, cool, okay, design's given it an eight. And then I'd put an eight up on the board. And then product would say, well, we have to do this. So this is like a 13, like no matter what, like boom, it's just, this has to happen. And so product's vote was there. And then tech would go, guys, we can't build this. This is like, this is going to take us months. I'm going to give it a one. And we go, oh, geez. All right. So it, it allows those conversations to happen super early and build that empathy and then maybe problem solve before you even get into building, before you even get into the specs. So I guess if my angle was to sell it in as like a, a time-saving way of making sure that nothing comes out later and that you're spinning your wheels six weeks down the line trying to fix something because designs pitch something that tech can't do. You've already kind of had those conversations super early, you know? So it's yeah. that democratic approach, I think, that might help sell it in. I've definitely sure. uh, tried to approach some early, early conversations in that way. And some of the problems I've encountered are that the engineers are less comfortable having conversations about intangibles. Sure. To, to absolutely. And that's why I usually say, and this is why I, I use it as an example, they'll go, I need more information before mm -hmm. I can come back to you. And you're like, fine, let's meet again. H how many days do you need? And then that way you're now kind of coming to the party with them and they're like, oh, cool. They get it that I, I need to go do some more research or I need to go talk to my lead or whomever it is so that they don't feel backed into a corner. Sometimes in these workshops, tech is like, they're talking the whole time. And you're like, hang on tech, because they jump into solution mode because right. that's where they're comfortable, right? right? And part of my job was, was also mediating the conversation. And I didn't get into it, but when we do that canvas, I actually time stop those boxes. And mm -hmm. I say, okay, for the next 10 minutes, we're only gonna talk about customer problems. And tech is like, oh, okay. But they'll wanna jump in, the, so, solutions is like four boxes in. So you really have to flex through this like uncomfortable, awkward space where tech is like, oh, I don't like all this ambiguity and designs mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, this is my jam and products like cool, cool, cool. So um, if I, I can spend time with you anytime or with the group to, to help you flex through that canvas to let those voices happen at the right time. Mm -hmm. And then again, if tech's not comfortable, just do it again in a few days. That's okay. I think... Um tech isn't comfortable because they would like to assess a wireframe rather than conversation yeah it's and you know what it's like a it's like we've been feeding them candy for breakfast you know it's it's like this bad habit that we got into to just be like here you go i'm not slow i'm not a blocker here's a wireframe you know you're like feeding yeah. them like oh my gosh stop yeah. tugging at my at my coattails right yeah. Yeah. so it's a hard habit to break for sure yeah. But small increments, you know. All right. I might I might connect with you after and let other people have a conversation. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Fantastic dialogue. Jennifer, thank you for coming on and, and again, sharing the question again. Uh, one last quick question. I'm going to open up to the forum and Jason Daphne just let us know in terms of how much time you have left. Um, so there was one slide when you guys were talking about measuring reporting. I think it was specifically around the portfolio operations and team operating model. And you mentioned around measuring and reporting, how important that is to, to kind of tangibly provide measurable sort of KPIs or metrics around it. What are some of the examples of KPIs or metrics you guys used um, to demonstrate um, uh, some type of those measurements or reports? Um, I feel like I've been talking too much, but I'm happy to keep going. Jason, are you okay? Are you yeah. like, stop? Yeah, um, yeah. Let let's, let's do it. I'll, I'll tell you a few and Jason might have some more um, because he's like way more smarter and senior than me. So he's probably got some like cool stuff I don't even know about. Um, so some of the things that we measure, so team of teams is um, I'm sure maybe you guys have heard of maybe Scrum of Scrums. Team of Teams is actually a book. Uh, I encourage anybody to read it. It's pretty cool. And it's a weekly cadence ritual that we have for all of our leads to give a quick, literally like two to three minute status update on um, the next week or two, week and a half of work. And it's just green, yellow, red, right? And it's a moment to be like, we're fine. Um, we're moving into this milestone. Like it doesn't have to be t tiny minutia, but it's also a moment for them to say we're low on people. So it, they can talk about resources. Um, so if there's a capacity problem, then other directors can go, oh, I've got a designer who's like just hanging out. Do you want to borrow them? And it's a moment for the whole lane to have that transparency of, of gaps of people. We also have a, like a, when we bring up an orange or an amber, or whatever you want to call it, it's something for us to go, hmm, okay, we need to kind of keep our eye on that. Let's not lose track of that and have it kind of get buried under the carpet. And our VP is in there and she's like, okay, noted, I'm going to follow up with you afterwards, right? And then if there's a red, like a blocker, like a massive problem, it might be a great opportunity for the team as a collective to potentially help that person and also for our VP to be an escalation point. So team of teams is like a really great quick status update that's meant to kind of have that transparency on a weekly basis. We also use JIRA, which is super day-to-day -day and, and kind of the smaller version of that. So like JIRA is like the Atom and then you kind of move into um, team of teams. And then the higher one is our portfolio management piece, which is um, actually a, a future it, it's not looking at what we've done and what we've delivered. It's looking at what we need to prepare for, what we need to kind of shape a team for, um, and what we what our product partners are about to start prioritizing with us so that we can get prepared. And we do that on is quarterly, six weeks, Jason, maybe let's say quarterly, yeah. quarterly basis where we have like a deck of chunks of work, almost like not epics, Anyway, let's not get into JIRA, sorry. Um, big chunks of work and we look at um, when they're potentially coming, what initiatives and objectives that they're kind of hitting so we know that it's purposeful work. So it's not just something that somebody's kid wants to deliver on the app and we're like, what? Um, so it aligns to like business goals and, and initiatives. And it also allows us to say, okay, wow, we need a ton of UXers on that. We're gonna have to shift some work. So we have that high level portfolio management, we have the status update, and then we have JIRA. That's all work stuff. We also have this awesome tool called 15.5, which is a great pulse check for how people are feeling, um, how they're tracking with their work. And it doesn't have to be a JIRA, like this is where I'm at, this is my to-do, this is what I've done. But it's like, a, here are some of the challenges that I've had this week, Jason. Um, we use this in our one-on-one. -on -one. And it's a way for me to kind of um, keep track of all of that. And then I also rate how I'm feeling that week. So we have like a really nice sentimental, um, like an engage sentimental sentiment and like an engagement um, pulse check that 15.5 allows us to do. So we can see, um, you know, patterns of, of happiness or unhappiness or, or whatever it is. And during COVID, that's been, you know, the first thing that we talk about in most of our conversations, how people are feeling. Um, mental health, um, you know, uh, it's okay if you're not feeling very productive today. And 15.5 allows us to capture that and, and measure that. Um, what else do we measure, Jason? Did, what did I leave out? No, it's, 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 
Yeah, I think you you pretty much hit on everything. One of the things that we've started doing in the last few months is normalize across all 500, 600 designers, like different ways of um, different ways of demarking status. So we've said, you know, something's either okay, fair, or poor. Um, excuse me, good, okay, or poor. Um, and then um, uh, we track different risk types because we're a bank, like legal, uh, reputational, all those kinds of things. So we started to normalize like, across that. And one of the tools that we're finding that's really successful to make sure all 500 initiatives are sort of talking the same is we've adopted um, uh, Airtable, which is a relational database tool to, to have everything talk to each other. Uh, bank specifically is, is in JIRA, um, but all the other lines of business have sort of started JIRA and sort of backed out. Bank's probably the most mature on the JIRA front. So it's kind of funny that we finally get into JIRA and now the rest of design is like, let's go to Airtable. So now I'm tasked with figuring out how to get data out of JIRA on a weekly basis to feed an Airtable and get all those bases syncing. Uh, but that's able to also to show us all kinds of different metrics around how long it's taking to get things done. Are people doing duplicative, triple work? Um, and I think the one place um, that we're still trying to get better at is showing real metrics around money. So like our customer account management lane, which I don't even know if it's called Cam anymore, it changes names a lot. Um, they're sort of that initial sign up. So like if you're gonna create an account with Capital One, like they're all about new customers. And um, uh, they have some really great metrics. Like they can get down to the penny every month with a lot of commas in there of how much money they, they uptick every month. But they've got really great metrics and really great, um, uh, oh, excuse me, metric tools that are tracking all those things. Whereas like a thing like ATMs, like you just can't slap armature on an ATM. Like the technology is just really old. So we have pockets of the business where we're not necessarily having deep like financial conversations around is something making us money uh, or not on something. That's great. Jason, thank you for providing such great insight. And, and it's interesting to see that the company is comfortable knowing that there's certain areas of pockets of areas that may not be able to tangibly provide a bottom line, a revenue metric uh, figure. So, and also definitely your, 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 your breakdown of that is fantastic. So again, I just wanted to say on behalf of the UX and the members here, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to answer the questions. I think we've covered most of the questions. I want to turn it over to Jody really, really quick. Um, before we end off and maybe uh, allow uh, the members to for the last sort of parting words with you all. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo, um, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight, Daphne and Jason and, and sharing all of this great information. I think a lot of stuff to, for folks to sort of take back and think about how they can implement it in their day-to-day -day or their specific situation uh, that they have with their um, business product and, and tech teams. Um, so thank you. Um, we are still working on our August uh, meetup, so we'll be announcing that as soon as we've got all of the details together. Um, in the meantime, Jason, Daphne, are you going to, are you able to post those slides anywhere, like, or those ones need to be kind of kept in a little bit? Yeah, they need to be kept in a little bit. Right. Um, I'm actually going to reach out to our court communications team to actually see if I can. I was very sneaky and did not put the word confidential on the slides. Um, so because it doesn't have that, it technically means I could. But um, uh, I'll know in the next week or two if I can. It's Jody's very familiar. It's a long process to get them to approve anything. So I'm, I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks I'd, I'd be able to, to post them more, more publicly. Awesome. Sounds good. I really appreciate you guys sharing the insight. It was fantastic. So much. Um, we had one announcement I completely forgot to share. Um, Jeff Gothelf, uh, who spoke a couple of meetups ago, um, is doing a special offer if you want to do any bulk orders of his book, Forever Employable. Um, so we can get that information over if any of you guys are interested. Um, uh, so just, just ping myself, Jim or, or Alex, and we will get you that information. Well, thank you again, Jason, Daphne. Thank you everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, we'll get the recording up on YouTube once it's finished doing its processing thing. Um, and we hope to see you in August. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us.
Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye.